Okay. So don't, don't worry about it for now. It's just that it's a bit long to write, and so I could write it when you finished the chat. Uh, okay, so a kind of scientific break, like we still a lecture, but it's a bit off topic, just to show that we can have fun with words. Um, <coughs> in the first lecture, we saw finite words, and I call that the, the set of words um, equipped with concatenation, I, I call it the free monoid. Like it's the largest monoid you can make by with a finite number of generators. You just concatenate everybody and you make no restrictions. We can extend that into the free group. So I'm back to finite objects, by the way. And so now I have an alphabet that is symmetric. For each letter, I also have uh, its inverse. So letter power minus one. And if you interpret concatenation as a product, then you see what's going to happen. Whenever I have a word, uh, well, actually, I study words where you never have any of these four factors. You cannot have a letter and its inverse uh, next to each other, because in this case, they cancel out. And so I get some set of finite words over, over sigma, and the concatenation becomes a bit special, because if I concatenate a minus 1 with a, I mean like this, we have two finite words, but you happen to concatenate the letters, then they cancel out and we get this. So you basically apply usual rules for you this notation power minus 1 and for multiplication, except that multiplication here is not commutative, but just the usual stuff. Do I make sense? Yes. Okay. So it's just uh, uh, take this new sigma set and yeah. uh, modify concatenation. Yeah, basically. And uh, yes, modify concatenation and yeah, and you forbid this exactly. But and uh, uh, in algebra theory, free group uh, is uh, a group that element can be represented uh, by um, multiplication of uh, some basis. Yes, and here you have a basis. Mm, pick, pick whatever free group you want that has two generators. You call the first generator A, you call the second generator B, and then you can represent any element uh, by a product of generators, as you explained, and this is going to behave exactly like this. So I'm forgetting, actually this is the most general, free, when I say the free group, it's not unique indeed, but it's the most de general one. I actually forget completely about the underlying group and I only keep, uh, I only keep w what I write on my paper when I work with a free group. So this is what I call the free group. And once again, a strong connection with algebra indeed. And I want to give ideas, not the full proof once again, because we don't have time, but uh, to enlighten why is it true that we can take two, like we can take one sphere, the classical thing, the Banach-Tarski paradox, we can take one sphere, so two-dimensional object living in a three-dimensional universe, split it in six, four or eight uh, pieces according to the exact proof you use. Yes, it seems that we have music. <laughs> Uh, and so we split it in six or whatever number of pieces and then we split the pieces in two and we can make two copies of the sphere. Like if we split uh, in six, we can use three pieces to make a copy here, three pieces to make a copy here. Uh, and it actually has something to do with the free group. The idea that we're going to perform the Banach-Tarski paradox on the free group first this is why the, we, we have four pieces here, so we will see. And then once we've done exactly this for the free group, like we split it in four elements and then realize that we get two copies of the free group underneath, uh, we will translate that into geometry. And that's when we will use a bit the axiom of choice, completely even. So for now, forget about spheres for a moment. And we'll, we'll, we'll use uh, some kind of map, uh, like uh, from the to mm, the contrary, we will take finite, finite, we will do only finite things. Don't worry, I, I, le, le, let me go step by step. First, we forget about the spheres, we'll get back to this problem later, but first I need to tell about the, the free group, and then we will take care of these details. There are a couple of details to take care of, we will do it. For now, j just forget about the spheres, we will, we will come back to them, don't worry. 
And we just look at these uh, four sets that are uh, so subsets of the free group. I recall that epsilon is the empty word, so it still exists. It's a neutral element of your free group, whatever your free group is. And then you have a partition, so I hope it's clear it's a partition. Either you have a word that finishes with B, or a word that finishes with B1, or a word finishes with A to the minus 1, and it's not of this form, like I have word, or everything else, like the empty word, words of this form, and words finishing with A. So, okay, Th they are disjoint. I hope it poses no problem. Yes? You're with me? Okay. And this is where you have fun. So uh, the free group, call it F, like free. We can write that F is equal to F1 union. So this is a disjoint union, by the way, of F2 with an A. And it is also equal to F3 union F4 with a B. Do I make sense here? Like, take any element of your uh, free group. Th th look at the second one. The second one is a bit easier. Take an element of your free group. Uh, if your, uh, the element of your free, free group finishes with a B, then it's in F3 by definition. No problem. If it finishes with something else, then uh, here it's going to be in F4. Like the element of your free group can be written, like for any word W that do not finish with B, you can just write it like this. And it will be the same. And this is exactly, well, the set of words of this form is exactly F4. Yeah. Maybe Yeah, so they are going to cancel out and you're going to find your W again. Isn't there a mistake like F1 and the 4 times B or F3 and the 2 times B? A mistake? I, uh, so I, th I guess, the I think this one is correct. And then maybe this one, you say there is a mistake? Because, no, if it's F3 union F2 times A, then I guess it's... Ah, no, it's not. Uh, I, I, I per personally, I see the way I just explained, so... So, yeah, it, it's clear. Yeah. Uh, w is Maybe there are other ways to do it. Uh, that's not excluded, yes? W is not from the F, it's from the all words. Yes, actually, the I no, the, I well, the idea is that um, whatever word you... The way you see it is like you work exactly with all the finite words, all the finite words you want, but whenever you see this appear, you cancel it out. So here, if you take any uh, reduced word, you, you start from a word which is in reduced form, so it has no B and it has none of these factors. And so now, if it finishes with B minus 1, and you concatenate that with a B... Then we get any word. Yes. Yes, B okay. Th this is because of my new definition of concatenation. Mm -hmm. okay. So the, the, the cancelling happens only when I concatenate two guys, and this is why it, it works. Mm -hmm. I concatenate with this one letter word, and it, it, if there is B minus one, it cancels out. And this is why I need to separate with B, because if W ends with a B, mm -hmm. yes, but it's in F3. So we can do nothing, but it's in F3. And you have exactly the same. I just take care. I, I, I just F1 is a bit strange because I wanted to put the empty word in one of these guys to really have everybody separated and not just having the empty words on our hands, which is a bit awkward. So I put the, empty, the empty words here. And so with the same kind of reasoning, you get convinced of this. So then basically F1 is in F4 times B and F3 is in F2 times A. Basically, yes. 
And so now, if this becomes clear, we have a partition of the free group such that we can build two copies of the free, free group, like we have done Banartarsky on the free group, up to this small detail, but we can take care of this detail. And now we can come back to the questions you started to, to ask, which were good questions, and now it's the time. Uh, how do we translate that in terms of geometry? And I think you felt a problem uh, that this is going to be a countable set, like F is a countable set, F1, F2, F3, F4 are countable, countable but the sphere is an, uh, has uncountably many points. And this is why I think you were started to be disturbed by the... You wanted infinite words, because you probably told yourself, since you have an uh, uncountable number of points, we'll need infinite words, because there are uncountably many infinite words. Um, actually, no, we'll stick with finite words and we'll solve this problem with the axiom of choice. This is why we'll need the axiom of choice at some point. So, for now, um, what can I write? So I will draw a sphere, and once again you know that I'm very cool for drawing things. So this is a sphere with a bit of imagination. And um, let me take the same notation just to be sure. We'll take two, I will define two rotation. Like, this is rotation F. I will give the angles, but for now I just show you the axis. Okay, this is extremely bad drawing, but the point is that they are um, orthogonal to each other. So th these are two axes. You could think of this axis being 1, 0, 0, up to, and this is the axis 0, 1, 0. So it turns like this. And in both cases, just okay. You need to take an irrational uh, number as an angle. I mean, an, irra an irrational fraction of the, um, of the length of the circle. Uh, and it's enough. Just to make things work, if you really want to write the details, what, which, I want, which I want to do, but it makes things simple to take as an angle for both of them something like arc cosinus of three fifths. This? Yeah. This is the angle. Like I defi I'm defining two rotations, so I gave you the axis of rotation, and I also need to give you the alpha, the angle. And for both these rotations, F and G, uh, I take this exact angle. So why do I do that? Because I'm skipping something that if you want to do it makes easier. Uh, actually, I could call this rotation A instead of F and this rotation B, and now maybe what I'm doing is becoming a bit clearer. And I want to say that you have a group generated by, the free group is generated by these two rotations. So concatenations become composition, and then you have a transformation of the sphere. Uh, doing nothing is the empty word, it got, uh, so it, everything works, and the only subtlety is to be, you, you have to ensure that you cannot reach the identity in any non-trivial way. I don't know, maybe if I compose A, B, B, A, I end up with uh, something that is just the identity, which is the empty word. And in this case, my group wouldn't be free. So if I, I need to ensure, and that's what I want to skip, I need to ensure that uh, any composition of A and Bs, which is non-empty, will give you something else than the identity. And if you really want to do it, you should write the matrices, the, you know, it's a, it's a um, rotation, so you can write the matrix for A, you write the matrix for B, the arc cos will cancel with the cosine and the sine that you have inside the matrix, so you will have nice rational numbers in your matrix, and then it's not very complicated, it's just common calculation to show that you never get the identity matrix. You do that by recurrence on the length of the word. So this is why we have an arc cos here. So if you write the matrices for the rotations, it becomes nice matrices with rational numbers inside. And it's irrational, so it's dense and will have everything. So I will skip the calculation because I want also to talk about something else afterwards. But if you compose A and B freely, you, you get something that is a free group, so which is somehow isomorphic to this. And now, um, we have to take care, there is a, a, a set of points that is annoying. And that's what I will skip mostly actually. We have to take care of a set of points 
the, the rotations in F, now I completely identify F, this F, with the group of rotation. I will completely, I, I think about A and B as rotation or as letters, because I think it's the same. So the rotations in F, F is a countable group, it's a countable set. The points I don't like are the fixed points of rotations of F. Each element of F seen as a rotation has exactly two fixed points. For instance, for A they are here and here, and for B they are here and here. I don't like these points. So I'll call D the set of fixed points of, rotation of uh, rotations of F. There are countably many, because tw twi two times a countable uh, cardinal is still a countable cardinal. And uh, here is the point where I really skip. You should take care of these points somehow, and I will just say, okay, it is a countable set with a little bit of trickery, we can get, get rid of them. And that's what I don't do, actually, to skip a bit of a technical part. So now what, I will do, what we can do, for instance, is to take, to partition the sphere minus this set, that's easier to do, we partition the sphere minus this set, which is countable, into four pieces, and then we will build two copies of uh, this uh, S minus D set again. And you can get back the sphere by adding more pieces, which I won't do. So how do I do that? So I have this sphere w minus the fixed points that now I, I, I don't care about, and I want to split it into four uh, pieces. So of course I will use F1, F2, F3 and F4. So first let, let me do something else. Just S minus D is countable. No, D is countable. Yeah. So S minus D is almost everything if you wish. Yeah. The idea is that I don't lose much. If I, I, I won't do the complete thing of splitting, splitting the sphere in two and, uh, and uh, in four and doing everything. I will just do it for the sphere, but I will, I will forget this countable number of points. Ah, it's okay. D is the set of forgotten points. D is what is the uh, set of... Uh, I, I, I understand what it is, but uh, this set no, is because uncountable. Uh, no, it, D is completely countable. No, uh, ah, S, S minus D is still uncountable. Yes, it's almost everything. If you pick a point at random of the sphere, you have probability one of being there, which is even much stronger than being countable. Uh, uncountable, I mean. So, yes, yes. So this is almost all the sphere. This is why I say we don't lose much. And if we really insist on doing the full thing, it just takes 20 more minutes to explain. But okay. All right. So now I want to... Uh, so I have this sphere. Uh, I remove the elements of D, but this is invisible because D is very small, so it's, your eyes are not good enough to see that I remove D. So now I won't exactly split uh, this in, in four pieces yet. I will do, just follow. I will pick a point, uh, say, not in D, of course, so here. Ah, sorry. Let's say here. So I'm on the sphere. And now uh, I can consider... Uh, like the, the image of this point by all the elements of F1. So I don't know. Uh, like this, like this, like this, like this. So of course, geometrically, this is unrealistic because F1 has no reason to be in one direction. But just to give you an idea, so this is the images of this point by F1. Uh, and I will do the same for others. Start from this point, split like this, and then I continue. And this is all the images by F2. I have four colors, this is fantastic. You can imagine again. So we fly all words in Yes, exactly. I, I, I will write it, but you take all words in F1, and for each, you apply them to the point. Uh, I will write it formally, but. Uh, I will write it. Maybe it's easier if I write it. I will call this P1 is the set of, um, uh, call it, I don't know, R of X. So this initial point, uh, for now I chose an initial point X somewhere on the sphere. And what I say is P1 is the images of X where R belongs to F1. 
and that's what I drew in red. P2 is defined similarly with R ranging in F2. P3 is the same and P4 is the same. So here my picture is not very realistic because uh, the rotations of F1 have no reason to be all in the same direction. Uh, intuitively they would go a bit of everywhere on the sphere, but just to fix the ideas, just to have a picture on our eyes. So same for P2 and so on. And now we have a problem because these are not, uh, this is not a partition of the sphere, this has no chains to be uh, even of the sphere minus D, because this is a countable set, this is countable set, P3 and P4 will be countable set, obviously, and this sphere, this S minus D is still uncountable, so we still have the same problem at the beginning. Mm. I know you're all laughing, so something is wrong? Yes. Oh, yeah, it's countable. Yes. But uh, uh, P1 is uh, like all of uh, no, the I subsets of. Yeah, I, I, I took one point x. x is not very. Uh, well, here I don't have a 4. x is not ranging over everything. I have one x for now. Ah, okay. So I have really one x that I chose I ra at random, say. Uh, yeah. So I, for a single x, it doesn't work. I have split only a part, countable part of the sphere. So now, I think I can, here is this. I told you that to solve this problem, we would use the axiom of choice, so. And oh. now we'll choose x that is not covered. Yes, so one way, to, one way to explain it is as follows. Once you've done this, you're very happy, you pick another x say x prime, for instance, that's not anywhere on the orbits of x, n in neither in p1, p2, p3, and p4. And now you have four more pieces that are completely do not intersect, and you add them, like you have a new p1, you add it to your old p1. You have a new p2, you add it to the old p2. New p3, add it to the old p3, and so on. And then you continue, you pick an yet another x, so an x prime, a second, sorry. And you do the same, you have four more pieces that you merge with what you had and so on until you've exhausted the sphere. And what I just said, when I said and so on until you've exhausted the sphere, is exactly the axiom of choice. That's the manifestation of axiom of choice. When you see something like and so on until you've exhausted, usually, well, not al always, but usually it's something to do with the axiom of choice. So how can I make it appear more clearly? If I want to write it, I can define an equivalence relation, say x, is uh, equivalent to y, so x and y are points of the sphere. If and only if uh, there exists a rotation in my free group uh, such that r of x equals y. Mm. Okay, is there okay this, uh, mm, what you said, because uh, imagine we have rational numbers and we pick one mm -hmm. uh, mm, by x of choice and uh, mm, we haven't covered uh, anything, so we pick another one and so on. No, but we, I, with the axiom of choice, we always pick the right one. We don't pick a random one. Yeah, it, 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 I don't understand the problem. Uh, but it seems you can enumerate uh, um, uh, continuum. Yes. Yes, yes, no, I, I, I'm not saying this is an algorithm. If I wanted to write it, I would need uncountably many, yes. So l this is why I'm writing in a different way, to make it, to get rid of this problem, actually. This is just an intuitive view, if you wish. This is, if you want to write it, it won't work. And this is why I'm writing it that way, you'll see. So if you want to write it that way, you say that two points are equivalent if you can go from one to, to another using uh, any finite words in my free group. Okay? okay. This is an equivalence relation, you can swap, you can, it's transitive because rotation compose and so on. Axiom of choice tells you what, in this case, when you have an equivalence relation, you have equivalence classes, okay, Co uncountably many. So you have your equivalence classes, and axiom of choice tells you that you can choose for a, i in real number, so here you have continuum indeed, for each equivalence class you can choose one element, like it's choice, I have a set of sets, and for each of these sets I can pick an element, because they are non-empty. 
So this is what I do. The, the one classical usage of axiom of choice is I have an equivalence relation. I pick an element in each uh, equivalence class. Okay? So I get these guys. So it's not a sequence. Mm -hmm. Technically, it's a function because e yeah. but, but I've defined a function. Why not? I, my, my notation is maybe a bit ugly, but this is perfectly well-defined mathematical object. And so now you can perfectly define uh, the set of uh, R of xi where R ranges in F1 and i ranges in the real numbers. So if you prefer, you can write this x of i like f is a function, but OK, this is just notation. And now you have a piece. And the same for p2, p3, and p4. This is a r. This is xi. Where? And so on. And that, and now, you do have four pieces that by construction uh, do not intersect. And using this, you can perfectly imagine two, two rotations that allow you to build one copy of S minus D and another copy of S minus D. You just take F1. The elements of F2, you have to rotate them by A, but OK, no big deal. And for the other copy, you take F3 and you take the elements of F4, but you, um, you uh, no, sorry, P. I wrote pieces here, so you take P1 and P2 rotated by A, that gives you a copy of the sphere, and then you take P3 and P4 rotated by B, and you have another copy of your sphere minus this annoying set. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yes? Do you repeat uh, what is Xi for I? Okay, uh, Xi for I uh, is actually... Um, like yes, for each, each Xi, is an element of an equivalence class for this relation. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how I, I, I don't tell how I enumerate them. The idea is that I know, uh, we, we, we saw that there are uncountably many equivalence classes for this. So I can bijack them with the real numbers. I don't know exactly how, but since you have uncountably many, uh, and the sphere is exactly the same cardinality as the real numbers, we know that uh, we have as many equivalent classes as real numbers. Yeah, yeah. And now, okay, I don't know exactly which one is which, but... So now we get the whole sphere using P1 and P2? Except D, yes. I, and you have to be careful that P2 should be rotated. Mm -hmm. But okay, you, you, this is what you do. Like you, 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 you take P1 and P2 out, you move them here, then you rotate P2 and you get another, another sphere minus so D. We take the upper and the bottom parts, and then the left and the right parts, and they will just join. Yeah. And then we put them together with some rotation again. Yeah. And we get the Yes, you have to be a bit more careful than this, but that's the idea. So the idea is that if you really want to get the whole sphere and not minus d, uh, you split in more pieces. Like you may maybe you heard that it's possible to do the Banach-Tarski paradox with four pieces. Actually, they are more complicated than this. What I am showing you is the six pieces way, and two pieces are missing because they are you you cut in a bit more, so you have more. Uh, Actually, somehow you get two different copies of P1, but say. Take, uh, the fixed points, they uh, are basically a disjoint union of fixed points that, yeah. are, um, that are the images of F1 union F2 times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The but th th there is even a bit dar more direct argument. But yes, there are tons of ways to do it, actually. Once you've got this, you've got the main idea, and getting rid of D is a technicality. Mm -hmm. The way you. S yes many, many different ways. And the idea is actually this. You will have some overlap because, of course, you have three and countable. Like with two pieces, you cover everything. Now you just need to cover a countable number of points. So actually, you take any, you need only one more piece that is uncountable and that will be enough. So you somehow trick to, to get it. Mm -hmm. So it's two simple ideas, one coming from 
words, or, well, groups actually, but here we really saw them as words, and simple idea of irrational rotation that go a bit of everywhere, that also connects somehow with what we saw earlier. Like, the, we use strongly the fact that these rotations have irrational angle and that they, so they are dense and so on. So that's why I like it, even if it's not completely related with the subject. So now it's, it's, it's not that magic, actually. I can erase. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not surprising. Maybe when we see it for the first time, it's really surprising. But if you think about it, it's not surprising that we have a bijection between the sphere and the two copies of the sphere, like between S and S square. We have a bijection between real numbers and couple of numbers. So it was a matter of building a specific bijection that's just built by, by rotations, but... It's not that horrible. Okay. So I think it's a good time if you want to start some discussion or if you have some questions to about what we saw so far or even comments or, okay. In particular, um, in the last, in the previous hal, uh, one hour and a half, I mentioned lots and lots of things uh, that I just told you it exists and if you see this one day, you will look up a book. For whatever this subject, if you happen to be interested, I can teach it at some point. You just have to ask me. Uh, you, you got my email address, I think. Yeah. So you really can, or just visit my office if you want me to explain it without organizing a full lecture, that's also possible. And about lecture notes, uh, I, I have a draft for the, la for the last lectures, I have notes, I have a draft, so I can send it to you. Uh, since it's a draft, it's an early stage, I don't want to upload it on the internet yet, so please contact me and I will, I will un send it back to you. Just a one-line email, uh, very something very simple, and I will send you the, the draft if you need it. Okay, so that was the technical interlude. How long do we, do we have left? Yes, half an hour. Okay. So who, I don't remember, who remembers about the lab seminar, f the theoretical uh, ter computer science lab sem seminar where I explained a few things about co uh, quasi-periodicity? Yes, it, it can be like this, I just, so you, no, you won, you won, okay. So in this case, I will get much, suddenly I will get much more specific. So, uh, a bit less of motivation because it's something really, really specialized. Okay. So we saw words, infinite words, and we saw that some words could be, for instance, periodic. We saw somehow a little bit that words could be, um, in a sense, more regular than others. You could have completely random words that are very difficult to describe, and you could have nice words that are periodic, or maybe just they have nice frequencies for their, factor, for their letters or something like this. But the intuition here is that we want to talk about infinite words and tell which ones are complicated, with quotation marks around complicated. And so after periodicity, another notion that is studied is quasi-periodicity. So here I'm back with an infinite word. So it's periodic if it's always the same pattern repeating. And um, I say, so if you remember, I said that u is a factor of w if uh, u is equal to w k ta ta ta, w k plus n minus 1, where k and n are integers. And in this case, so u is always a finite word. When I say an infinite word has a factor, the factor is always a finite word. And last time, if you remember, I said that in this case u covers positions k Ta ta ta, k plus n minus 1. Uh, the length of u big n. So I say that q, a finite word, remember, if it's underlined, it's infinite. If it's not underlined, it's finite. So q 
is a quasi-period of W if um, each position of W is covered with occurrences of Q. So uh, I don't have my favorite example in mind, but let's try with the Fibonacci word. Uh, a, B, A, A, B. Yes, you get to know it by heart at some point here. So A, B, A. So I got the It's difficult today. Let me do it another way. Et cetera. Um, okay. So this is a prefix of the Fibonacci word. And you see that it is not periodic. Uh, you can guess from what we did last hour, but it is covered with occurrences of ABA. You have it here as a prefix, so in particular position zero is covered. You have it here, okay. You also have it here, you also have it here. They share a letter, but why not? We have it here, 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 and so on. So this prefix is covered with occurrences of ABA. So ABA is a quasi-period, and actually if you continue the Fibonacci word, you realize that you can continue this forever. A word, when it's infinite, has no reason to have only one quasi-period. In particular, here, uh, ABA, AB should also be a quasi-period. So let's check. Well, here we will have a problem with this A, but ABA, AB is here, ABA, AB is here. No? Did I just no, I did something wrong. Yeah. In my Fibonacci. Ah, yes. A, B, A, A, B is here, like this. A, B, A, A, B, A, B, A, and okay, I guarantee you that there, there is A, B. Um, so, so you might very well have several different quasi-periods, and even infinitely many of them, it's the case here, about Fibonacci word, can you guess, like, why, a simple way to understand that this word has infinitely many quasi-periods? Because each quasi-period is quasi-periods, no. Because words are prefixes of each other? Yeah, like something like that. So, yes, you have pieces. Words are prefixes of each other. Quasi-periods are prefixes of each other. Because actually, all quasi-periods are prefixes of the Fibonacci word, or the word we are looking at, because you have to cover position zero. Observation, if your Fibonacci word can be written like this, with some morphism mu that doesn't erase letter. So if you have a quasi-period, you remember, mu of f is equal to f. So if you have the quasi-period, its image by the morphism will also be a quasi-period. And that's exactly what happened. ABA, if you take the image, I think it should be ABA, AB. Yes, it is. Yeah. And so you can guess that the image of ABA, AB will also be a quasi-period, and so on and so forth, and so you will have infinitely many of them. Of course, they length grow, because you can only have one quasi-period of a given length. If you know things about the set of quasi-periods, you, know you can show other good properties about the word. I won't get into the details, but for instance, if you have too much quasi-periods, you you, the, the word will be periodic. If you really have a huge number of quasi-periods, you can actually imply that the word is periodic. Stuff like that. And so a question uh, started, I think, in the years 2000, 2004 maybe. It was, uh, I, what can we say about the set of quasi-periods of an infinite word? So very good open research question. Uh, what can you say about, you know, like in an exam, and you have this kind of question, and you're like, okay, what's like, the actual question? Here, I want to show you a few results that um, allow to determine the set of quasi-periods of uh, an infinite word, whatever it is. 
So like I you bring me an infinite word, uh, I will probably be able to tell you what is its set of quasi-periods and to compute it, I will use the tool that I'm going to show now. So if you remember what I will need from last time, two things. Like I'm coming back here. So u is a factor of w, that's what we say. w is infinite. Uh, I will need two more definitions. I say that u is right special or just special in w if u a and u b are factors of w for uh, a not equal to b uh, to well two different letters a and b. So a factor is right special if sometimes you see it with an a and sometimes you see it with a b for two different letters a's and b's. So if you take binary alphabet then it becomes even simpler. It's just that you don't know what is the bit after u because sometimes it's one and sometimes it's zero. And now, so that's going to, re for, for those who were at the seminar, the, this result is going to remind you something. We have, we can say something about the quasi-periods of a word. So W is just an infinite word. Uh, Q, a quasi-period. and a, a letter, then suppose q is a quasi-period then qa is if and only if q is not tri-special. I'm going to explain that in a minute. Now suppose QA is then Q is if and only if either Q you are not Right, sp right special is uh, that sometimes your factor happens with an A after and sometimes uh, your factor happens with a B after. ABA is right special because here you have ABA with an A and here you have ABA with a B. So this is why ABA is right special. But B is not right special. Whenever you see a B after you have a A, you have an A. You never have BB, so B is not right special. Or Q is an internal factor of QAQ. Is an internal factor of QAQ. So, now I wrote it, I explained. The idea is that um, we suppose that we found a quasi-period. Because here, for instance, it's not very hard to observe that ABA is a quasi-period. And if you do a little recurrence with the, with the morphism, you will prove with elementary means that, OK, ABA is a quasi-period. So we found a quasi-period. And now the question is whether QA, so the, the Q where I added the letter, is also a quasi-period. So why does it make sense? If I erase all the colors here, I will use this Fibonacci word a lot. I know that a quasi-period must be a prefix. So I found that ABA is a quasi-period by elementary means, say. All right. And now I can ask myself whether ABA with the next letter is a quasi-period or not. And then I start a kind of recurrence. It's not, not recurrence, but you get the idea. Like I found this, I want to extend one more letter. And we have a necessary and sufficient condition for this. You can extend a letter if and only if your, your quasi-period is not right special. So here, it doesn't work. ABA is right special, we saw it. 
So it means that this with one more letter is not a quasi-period. So this extension doesn't work. And we also have a reverse theorem when we suppose that, still, we found a quasi-period ABA. Maybe it is, here we had luck, it's very small. But maybe the quasi-period we found was very big. And now we want to know whether we can remove a letter, like we consider a shorter prefix. Is it still a quasi-period? Here it isn't. And well, once again, we have a, co a condition for this. So if QA is a quasi-period, Q, so I remove the letter, I is the letter, uh, is a quasi-period, if and only if we have this condition, either QA, QA is not a factor of W, or Q is an internal factor of this. Um, here we can check. ABA, ABA is a factor. We can find it here. So the, um, and we don't have any other factor of ABA inside. So this condition fails, and so we cannot uh, either remove one letter here. And now, instead of proving or finding all the quasi-periods of a word, if you find only a subset of them, then you can uh, grow your subset by trying bigger and smaller guys. And very often it's enough to have the whole set of quasi-periods. Another way to, say, to see that uh, is to, to, to say that, okay, suppose you bring me a word and we know what are the right special factors of that word, and we know what are the factors that appear as a square like this. Like we, we know the prefixes even, we don't need the factors. We know what prefixes are right special, and we know what prefixes somewhere appear as a square like this then we can completely determine the set of quasi-periods. And it's a good news because these two definitions are not ad hoc. Like, I did, not invent, I did not invent right special factors. It's something extremely well studied, and it's a standard, uh, standard um, question to understand, given an infinite word, what are its right special factors? That's a thing that specialists can do very, very well. So they, we can reuse knowledge. Same for the squares here. You remember we did the whole thing about avoiding square factors and so on, so it's the same. Prefixes that happen as squares is also something very well studied, so we can reuse lots of mach machinery to study the set of quasi-periods. And now, depending on time, I can, uh, I think, 20 minutes or even less? 20. 20, okay. I can either prove the theorem or uh, show you how to use it. And I think I prefer to show you how to use it. Yeah. Uh, but it's both, it's both technical in, in any case. Because I hope there's not too much of magic. Uh, okay. The idea is that the proof is, not, is nothing magic. You just write, uh, it's a bit like what we did with finite words at the beginning. You write your equations and then you, you do calculations, except that you do calculations with equations and words and you get your result, basically. It's not easy to find if you are not used, but if you read the proof, it's, it's clear. And now how to use it? So of course I chose an example where everything would work well. Hopefully, because as you could observe, sometimes my example do not work well. All right. So let's keep this here for now. So I propose the following morphism because. I, okay. And H of B is. So we have this morphism H, which is not chosen at random, of course, it, uh, it has nice properties, but okay. And we want to study the set of quasi-periods of the fixed point of this morphism in A. This fixed point exists because the image of A starts with A, uh, and both images are long enough so it will grow and so on, so we have this fixed point. And uh, actually, We claim, so this is a bit embarrassing because um, you probably cannot ju just accept that right now, but the idea is that it's a bit a non-deterministic theorem. You guess what the set of quasi-period is and then you prove that you were right. But the guess is aided, so I will just give you the set of quasi-periods.
The quasi-periods are the words of the form h to the n of ABA. In, uh, in W, so for n non-negative. So just by looking at the images of the morphism, you can guess that ABA itself will be a quasi-period, because here you have ABA and ABA, so everywhere you will have. And here, you only miss an A to the left to become to have a quasi-periodic image, but here you have an A in the end of both of them. So actually, the image of any word by uh, H will be ABA quasi-periodic. So that's something. H of A something is ABA quasi-periodic. Of course, if you have a fixed point, we can do what we said before. Uh, ABA is a quasi-period, so certainly, since everything is injective and so on, the image of ABA is going to be a quasi-period. I recall you that we have H of W equals W. Yes, exactly. So this is uh, how, now I'm trying to justify that this guess is not completely crazy, yes. The, the difficulty is to prove that there is nothing else, of course. But uh, now I'm trying to convince you that I didn't invent this theorem out of magic. I, I saw this morphism and I, I, I say, okay, I, I observe ABA is a quasi-period, I observe that all these guys are quasi-period, and now the, the question, of course when you're doing research, we don't know, you don't know yet that this is a theorem, but the question is, is there something else? And so you try to say, okay, let's try no, let's try to prove that there is nothing else. And if the proof succeeds, then you have your set of quasi-periods, that will be the case. If the proof fails, you found another quasi-period and then you can iterate the process. So it's like an algorithm for mathematicians. So we did actually uh, the step one. So step one was just to say they are actually quasi-periods. So we guessed that. Yes, be be because ABA is, for what I explained on the image, is that clear? That just ABA alone is a quasi-period, okay? And then the image of a quasi-period in a fixed point will be a quasi-period, actually. Because if you're on your infinite word and you have occurrences everywhere, you apply this, and now the image, this will be sent to this, this will be sent to this, and you will still have quasi-periods. And here it's the same because we, are, we have this relation. This is, this is the cool thing with fixed points. This is why we love fixed points, because we can use this. And then everything works. Okay, step two. The HN of ABA are all right special. Why? Uh, just by looking at the image of A and B, of course we will have the image of A somewhere and we will have the image of B somewhere. Here we, here we have ABA followed by A and here we have ABA followed by, by B. So just ABA alone without H is right special. And now you observe that the image of A starts with an A, the image of B starts with a B. So if we have ABA A somewhere and ABA be somewhere else, when you take the image using still this, you will be mapped to h of a, b, a, h of a, etc., and h of a, b, a, h of b. And since this starts with an a and this starts with a b, we still have this guy is right special. Now you, ma you make an induction and you will get it for all natural integers. So I'm getting closer and closer to my theorem. So I told you it's not very complicated to study the right special factors of a word. You see, it's really straightforward. In this case, at least, this case was, des was designed to be nice. Now, something a bit more involved. Um, step three is we have to talk about... Like, now I know that all these quasi-periods cannot be extended. Like I cannot take th uh, some, somebody who would have one letter more. I still need to show that we cannot take one letter less. 
So I will do something that's slightly more complicated, but that will turn out to be useful afterwards. I will say that the prefix is p. such that p square is factor r um, and there are a bunch of them you have the h n of a the h n of a b the h n of a b a So before looking at this guy, just look at the statement for a minute. Here I really wrote the prefixes p such that p square is factor. Um, for instance, uh, okay, I should really write the beginning of this word. Yes, there is a trick to do it by my head. Um, here I have an a. Okay, and say here I have a square. So this guy is actually, I talk about this guy. Y you do not need to have the a square at the beginning. What I want is that I, uh, I want the factor as a beginning and maybe somewhere else the factor as a square. So here a is in this set because a is a prefix and a, a square is a factor. It, it doesn't need to be at the same place. Same for a, b and for a, b, a, by the way. So, and uh, this is exhaustive. This is why I wrote all of them, because this is exhaustive. You have no other guys like this. Uh, actually, uh, for, and I will, okay, we'll erase the theorem for now. I'll write it again when we will need it. So I will prove step three in this column. If uh, p is shorter than six characters, then you can do an, you can do a hand verification. I won't do it completely. Uh, you do it by hand. So you look at wh what are the set the the guys here that are uh, of length uh, six or less. You have a using power zero, and it could be zero here. You have a a is inside. You have a b a b is inside. You have it here. ABA is inside here, and other guys are not. Uh, ABAA is not, doesn't appear as a square anywhere. You can show it by recurrence or just checking by hand, and so on. And until the um, prefix of length 6 is exactly H of A. So it's still in there. So for you, 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 you look at prefix of length 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and for each of them, you make uh, ad hoc reasoning to show either you, you see directly that there is a square, or you use the um, properties of the morphism to make a quick recurrence to show that it is not. Okay, so just exhaustive verification. It's an exercise, it's a bit boring. And now, you assume there is some p not in this set. Uh, okay, same thing. Um, since I checked it was true for A, A, B, and A, B, A, by applying the morphism and a quick recurrence shows you that these guys are actually in the set. If A square appears, then H of A square will appear, and then H and, uh, I should say, and so on and so forth. Do I, do I make sense? It's always the same reasoning. Like if A square appear, then image of A square appear, and image of image appears, and by recurrence, all of them appear. So all these guys are actually prefixes satisfying this property. What's not trivial is that they are the only ones, and that's what I'm doing right now. So for the P less than 6, I do it, and now you assume you found a P uh, prefix not equal to these guys, I don't know. And you and you take the shortest one. And of course I'm going to find an even shorter one. So it's a kind of induction in this guise. In this case. Okay. So P is a prefix p square occurs somewhere, and p is not any of these guys. 
since p is a prefix, it must be longer than this. So p must start with uh, the sixth fourth character. So p should start with ABA, ABAB. So this is magic word. ABA, ABAB will make everything work. Um, why, why, this word, why is this word magic? Because it's something that I like to call, even if it's not a proper term, uh, it's not official definition, say, but I like to call this a synchronizing word. So usually synchronizing word means something else. Here what I mean is that if um, pi, say, of a, B, A, A, B, A, B is a prefix of W, then there exists pi prime such that H of pi prime equals pi. So the idea is that whenever I see A, B, A, A, B, A, B, I know that here I'm coming from the, some h of a. You know, since this word is the image of something by a, I can look at the inverse image. And the, whenever I see a, b, a, a, b, a, b, I know that I'm starting the, in, the image of an a. This is what I want to express here. But the, the formal statement is this. And once again, uh, this takes exhaustive, um, exhaustive verification over uh, length of all the words that you can enumerate over some length. So the point is that you do it with a computer. But here the morphism was designed to make this to work. Every time you see ABA, ABA, B somewhere in your word, like you are here, you have your W, you have and then ABA, ABA, B. So that's right. Then you know that uh, this comes from some p prime by uh, morphism h, and this comes from uh, a by morphism h. And here we are going to use strongly this, of course. So how does it work? So I will write it like, th th like this, so P is a prefix, so P starts with the magic word, and so I will even use, reuse this, I will write P is equal to A, B, A, no, excuse me. P square occur occurs somewhere, say with uh, some prefix pi, like this. Now I know that I can, I can expand this in A, B, A, a, B, A, B, <laughs> with some P prime, P prime being the rest of uh, P, so we have that's the definition of P prime. And since we have a P square, we have it again. So now we are sure that um, this has an inver inverse image by uh, your morphism. So there is some word, I don't know, u1, such that h of u1 is equal to exactly this. And for the, using this again, here you also have an, 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 an inverse image for this. No, for this, sorry like here. Exactly I'm applying exactly the same fact. So you have some u2 such that h of uh, All right. And this is exactly p actually. We can see it here. So since this, have, uh, this has an a reverse image, we can write this as uh, u1 is equal to u2 times p, well, concatenated with p. And so since this has a reverse image and this has a reverse image, the end, by the equation of morphism, the general equation like this, 
we can conclude that this also has a uh, reverse image. That makes sense here? Yeah. Okay. So, in particular, somewhere in your word, you have h minus 1 of p, h minus 1 of p, because you had your two occurrences of p, so they will ma be mapped down to two occurrences like this. And h minus 1 of p is also a prefix. But it is strictly smaller, because this morphism, when you take the inverse image, you divide the length by 6. So my initial p was not minimal. So this is how we use strongly this fact to show this. So now we know that the prefixes p such that p squared is a factor are exactly this guy and nobody else. Because if it were no somebody else, we could take the reverse image, and if we took the reverse image, we would end up in AAB or ABA that we show by, we shown by exhaustive uh, search initially. So in, when you're actually doing research, it's a bit interesting because it's a mix of exhaustive, exhaustive search that you do with a computer and like it's guided exhaustive search. You also have to be a bit clever. And um, one last thing that you could prove using a bit of the same argument, like reusing heavily this uh, word, so, um, is that none, th these guys are not quasi-periods. And to do it, first you observe that A and AB are not quasi-periods, and then you do a bit of the same. You take the smallest of this guy that would be a quasi-period, and by exactly the same kind of trick, you show that the reverse image would also be a quasi-period, and you contradict minimality. It's exactly the same reasoning that you have to do, and you have to do it twice, one for this guy and one for this guy. So it's a bit overwhelming, but I think we're going toward the, the ends here. And so now, I claim that this is enough to prove the initial statement that's here. Because if you had some quasi-period other, another quasi-period elsewhere, so you suppose you have a quasi-period Q. If uh, Q square occurs somewhere in the word, then I know it's one of these guys, then necessarily Q is one of these guys, but among these guys, only ABA is a quasi-period. I'm happy. But if Q does not occur as a square in my word, then I can remove a letter. And by my initial theorem, I, I risked it, but you remember, the, the condition to remove a letter and still being a quasi-period is exactly this. It's exactly whether I'm a square or not. So I can actually remove letters from Q until I find something that is actually a prefix that appears as a square, and then I have the same reasoning. And now you tell me, you could tell me, okay, but now I have found this smaller quasi, this smaller guy, which is exactly uh, HN of ABA quasi period. Why can, cannot I grow again back to what I had? Because they are right special. So if you had a quasi period somewhere. You, you, you would need to remove letters and uh, to find your guy, but you cannot because at some point you would arrive at this step, and this step is exactly um, a, a right special word with a letter which cannot be a quasi-period. Maybe I should rewrite the initial theorem now. Okay. Well. So that's it. If you know who is right special and who is uh, occurs as a square in your prefixes, then you can get the set of quasi-periods of a word. Like this, uh, some word Q, Q is uh, quasi-period. Q with uh, one word letter added is not a quasi-period, and with two letters added... Uh, it could exist. Yes, you mean that this is quasi-period? This is not, but this is. Yes, yes this can happen. So, in uh, the previous explanation, when we erased some letters and yes. got uh, closed periods, and then uh, said that we can't uh, add the letters because yes. uh, this closed period 
is the right special, but we can add. Uh, no, a lot of what I what I mean is that actually, if you erase letters, yeah. you start from uh, your very big quasi period Q, and now you start to erase letters, and you look at the point, so this is not Q anymore, this is, I don't know, R. You look at the point where you're not exactly R, uh, R square, you're one step before. So what I mean is that R square, so R here you have an A, okay? So R square is a quasi-period. Q is a quasi-period. And everything in between is a quasi-period. Because I, I, I stop at the first uh, R uh, square that I find. Okay, and, and so I, I start from Q, I remove letters, and I remove letters until I find R, which is the first one I find by removing letter that is a square. I will find it at some point by the theorem. Now you don't look at R. You look at R with one more letter, RA. By what I just said, it is a quasi-period, because I obtained it by removing letters from Q, and, uh, and I've, I haven't reached a square yet, so it must be a quasi-period. But here, in this specific case, my R is exactly ABA, and it is right special. That's one of the things I show. My R here is HN of a, ABA, and this I shown is right special. And it is forbidden for any word, that, that's, that's the th what the theorem tells you, is that if you have any right special word R, then you have no chance that uh, RA is a quasi-period. You mean such R that R squared yeah. is a factor? Uh, no, R is right special. Here it's both, actually. No, we erase letters until R is... A no, we erase letters until we find R such that R squared, yes, is a factor. That's right. And it turns out that in this case, by what we've shown here, it is also, but that's a coincidence, R is right special. And this is why we, the reasoning works, actually, because in this case, R is also right special. And so you remove your letter, you remove your letters, and you will find RA. And RA is forbidden to be a quasi-period by the theorem. So you have both a quasi-period and forbidden to be a quasi-period, which contradicts. So this is why the only possibility left is this one. And uh, knowing this, uh, here it's interesting. This one was designed because it has all its quasi-periods are quasi-periodic, except one. Like you have ABA, and all the other quasi-periods are themselves ABA quasi-periodic. This is why we, we used this morphism, actually. What ABA is quasi-periodic ABA? ABA is a period of itself. Yeah, but it's not, it doesn't have any quasi-period. You're not a quasi-period of yourself, otherwise everybody is quasi-periodic and uh, it's not fun. And here A, B is not a quasi-period because you cannot, uh, you need a B here. And A is obviously not a quasi-period. So A, B, A is not, uh, is itself non-quasi-periodic, but all the other quasi-periods have this guy as a quasi-period. So th this was a question, like the first question, can we build a word which has uh, quasi-periodic quasi-periods? And so the answer was, okay, you need ABA at the beginning, but then you can go everybody else quasi -priority. Are there any applications of this morphism? This, form, this morphism by itself, no. The fact that you can uh, determine quasi-periods of words, yes. But this morphism itself is just really uh, like... An example. Yes, it's a good example. Like when we first had the theorem, we wanted to try it, so we tried it on a, on a case where everything works nicely. We did much worse proofs with the same theorem and the same ideas, and uh, words that are actually more interesting by themselves, but okay. In particular, we can get the, the quasi-periods of all Schumian words. And we have a general formula for the set of quasi-periods of a Schumian word in function of just the parameters alpha and x that I explained. But this is much more involved. So that's it. That was, uh, that's what I did more or less one year ago, for instance. Uh, then after we had more complex proof, but this is the thing. First we had this theorem that was not extremely complicated to get, and then you want to try the theorem, so you try on, first, uh, on the first uh, easy example that, you, that was provided by my advisor, and then you go further, of course, but we don't have time for this. But that was actually part of my PhD job. No, thanks to you.